The subject of today's session is admittedly one of the most enigmatic passages in Genesis, particularly enigmatic for us because it pertains to a realm that is fundamentally foreign to our experiences. I like to describe our world as the post-tree world. And this is in the pre-tree world, referring, of course, specifically to one very important tree. The tree identified in Genesis chapter 2, and that becomes central in the events of Genesis chapter 3 as the tree of knowing good and evil. Now, before we begin, I feel compelled to share with you an important observation that may seem technical, but I think has a lot of impact on how we understand the narrative described in Genesis. And that is that very often we find the tree described as the tree of knowledge, or knowledge of good and evil. Tree of knowledge inevitably carries the connotation that Adam and Eve, before they ate of the tree of knowledge, had no knowledge. Well, first, the linguistic point. And we've made this observation in the past that in the Hebrew Bible, there is an extraordinarily complex and detailed system of punctuation, what are called the cantillation points. The small symbols that are attached to every word of the Hebrew Bible that on the most basic plane instruct one who is reading the Bible in public readings as to how to sing the words of the Bible, because there is a melody that pertains to every single verse, every single word. But beyond that basic play, what this system indicates is exactly how the words of the Bible are punctuated. The reason I'm calling your attention to this observation right now is because, inevitably, on the one hand, the words in Hebrew that are usually translated as tree of knowledge of good and evil are indeed eitz, hadat, tovvara. But the punctuation indicates that it's not the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It's the tree of knowing good and evil. So the tree isn't the tree of knowledge, because we aren't speaking about knowledge here. We're speaking about a very specific type of knowledge, namely, knowing good and evil. Beyond the linguistic observation, as it immediately presents itself, this is an important consideration for us to bear in mind when we ask ourselves, what changed? What changed as a result of Adam and Eve eating the forbidden fruit? That is, when we read the narrative, and we're going to begin with Genesis chapter 2, from verse 7, besides the linguistic observation, it becomes patently clear that knowledge is not what Adam and Eve obtain by their violation of God's command. In verse 7 and on, we read, Then God the Lord formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his knowledge the soul of life, and man became a living creature. And immediately afterward, we read about the garden. And God the Lord planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And 
what then follows in verse 9 is God making to grow every tree out of the ground. And among these trees, two that are named in particular, the tree of life. We'll return to that a little bit later. And the tree of knowing good and evil. And verse 15, this is critical. God took man and put him into the garden to work it and to watch, guard it. And in verse 16, the command. Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but, verse 17, of the tree of knowing good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Now, it should be clear to us all that if Adam and Eve had no knowledge prior to eating of the tree of knowing good and evil, what we just read would be not only out of place, it would be absurd. How can God, how can anyone issue a command to someone who doesn't have knowledge and then punish that receiver of the command for violating it? Only a being endowed with knowledge is capable of being entrusted with the responsibility of working, guarding the garden, only a being with knowledge can be given the divine command and held accountable, held responsible for its violation. Which, of course, inevitably then raises the question, so what did the tree signify? What did it add if Adam and Eve already had knowledge. That's an issue to which we still need to return. Before we do, there is inevitably an additional question that we need to address altogether once we encounter this tree in the first place, and that is, if it's a tree of knowing good and evil, and we read explicitly, after all, that God made it. That is, this is one of the objects of the divine creation of which we read in Chapter 2, verse 9, so is God responsible for creating evil? Now, admittedly, we've discussed this question in other contexts as well, so I'm not going to dwell on it at length, but I can't make short shrift of it either, because it is so critically important for us to consider. So, did God create evil? Inevitably, the answer, of course, is with all the difficulty that results from saying this, yes, because God created everything. And as we've noted in the past, the alternative to answering this question in the affirmative, yes, God is the source of evil, would be to say that God is not the source of everything, that there is some kind of other source out there, which is certainly something that contravenes the most essential beliefs that we have with respect to God being the source of all. Furthermore, of course, as we've noted elsewhere as well, that God creates evil isn't something we need to merely conjecture because it is explicit in the Bible. In Isaiah chapter 45, in verse 7, God says, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I am God who does all these things. Now, I feel compelled to remind us all of an additional nuance that we noted elsewhere as well with respect to this verse, because it certainly is germane here for us to recall its implications, especially as they will pertain to the tree of knowing good and evil. And that has everything to do with the choice of verbs in this verse, where, as we readily note, 
there are three verbs that appear, at least three verbs in the Hebrew, although the translation employs a fourth. They are, focusing upon the Hebrew text, yotzer, which we translate as form, that is, again, that God forms the light, The second verb that appears is Tore, that God creates. That verb appears twice in the creation of darkness and the creation of evil. And the third verb, which is alternatively translated in the English as making and doing, is the Hebrew Ose. What difference is there? among these different verbs. Well, forming, doing, making, all pertain to something that one brings into existence. What about bore, the verb that we're translating here as create? This is an observation that we've already made in particular with thanks to one of the foremost Bible scholars and philosophers of the 12th century, Rabbi Moses Maimonides, who notes that in Hebrew, we employ As Maimonides notes, Bore is a term that in Hebrew generally we often take to refer specifically to creation ex nihilo, creating from nothingness. It is in that vein that the verb appears in Genesis chapter 1 in three different verses. In verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In verse 21, the first verse that pertains to the creation of animal life, God created the great sea monsters and so on. And in verse 27, the verb appears three times, and God created man in his image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And what, of course, is significant in all three instances is there's something about creating that doesn't pertain to anything that came before. Obviously, in the first verse, the creation of the heavens and the earth comes from nothing at all. In verse 21, the creation of animal life, likewise, is discontinuous with anything before. So it is indeed creating from nothing. And likewise, the creation of man. Man, completely distinct from anything else, is in essence created from nothing. Which occasions Rabbi Moses Maimonides to suggest that just as in Genesis chapter one, this verb, bara, rendered again as create, pertains to creating from nothing. In Isaiah chapter 45, verse seven, it pertains to creating what is nothing. God forms light, but creates darkness. Because darkness is not a presence. Darkness is an absence. It is, after all, an absence of light. By creating light, God creates a world in which there is the potential for an absence, and thus creates the absence, darkness. Just as in the continuation of the verse, God creates evil, which likewise 
is not a presence, it is an absence. The reason that this is especially germane for us to consider here is, of course, firstly, because it definitively answers our question, do we regard God as the source of evil? And indeed, we do. As we've noted on many occasions in the past as well, it is in the same vein that in Amos chapter 3, verse 6, we read the rhetorical question, shall evil be full of city? And God has not done it. And in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 38, out of the mouth of the Most High, do not proceed both evil and good. But there's an additional dimension that we also appreciate that is particularly relevant with respect to the tree. And that is, God creates the potential. Knowing good and evil is a potential that is actualized by the choices that we, as human beings, make. So in that vein, yes, God creates evil. It is, again, God who creates the tree of knowing good and evil. But in as much as what God is really doing is creating a potentiality, what he's doing is empowering us, giving humanity the choice. Now that inevitably brings us back to the question of what is the knowledge that Adam and Eve possessed before they ate of the tree of knowing good and evil. They had to be able to receive a divine command. What describes the level at which they were functioning? And to answer this question, I think we have no further to look than in Genesis chapter 1, the verses that we just noted with respect to creation include here verse 26 and verse 27. In verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now, I must concede here that the translation is debatable. Obviously, God has no physical image. And the Hebrew word that is rendered here as image Selim is arguably better translated as essence. That is, let us make man in our essence after our likeness. And inevitably, what we then read in verse 27 is that God created man with his essence. In the essence of God created he him. And likewise, in much the same vein, recalling chapter 2, verse 7, when we read that God breathed into man the soul of life that pertains to that essence of the divine imprinted upon man. But then, what is that? What is that essence of God? imprinted upon man. There obviously are a number of ways in which we could go about trying to answer this question, but perhaps the most basic and most important for our purposes is to consider Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 10, where we read, God the Lord is truth. He is the living God and the everlasting King. God represents absolute truth. And to the extent that man is imprinted with the divine essence, man signifies a being of truth, a being whose hallmark is the ability to deal in concepts of truth and reality 
as opposed to that which is false, that which is simply not real. This is the manner in which man is created by God. Now, what does it mean to speak of conceiving of reality exclusively in terms of truth as opposed to falsity? It's really not difficult to illustrate this. We can very readily consider a, an obvious example from arithmetic. One plus one equals two is a true statement. One plus one equals three is a false statement. The way God creates man, everything in the world is as simple and straightforward, as unambiguous and unequivocal as that. As recognizing one plus one equals two is true, one plus one equals three is false. And the choice that presents itself to man is simply this, distinguishing between what is true and what is false. It is indeed in that vein that we can likewise understand the words of Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 29. Behold, this only have I found, that God made man upright. Because this is indeed the way God summons human beings into existence. This uprightness, this clarity, this definitive ability to distinguish what is true from what is not. Except the continuation of the verse intimates that things don't remain so simple. But they have sought out many inventions, intrigues, contrivances. That's not part of the way God man made men upright. That's something else, an additional dimension. And while we will indeed in just a couple of moments, consider at greater length what that additional dimension means. Let's first consider what it means to say that God made man upright. Consider again the verses that we've already seen from chapter 2, in particular verse 15. And God the Lord took man and put him into the Garden of Eden to work it and to guard it. What I stress here is that the mission with which God charges man, that mission that imposes upon man responsibility, and as we already noted, you can only charge with responsibility of being with knowledge. That mission doesn't involve creating anything, doesn't involve generating anything new, it involves purely resonating with that which man already is, a being endowed with perception, a being that perceives truth versus falsity. And in much the same vein, in verse 19, we read the hallmark of what man does in the Garden of Eden is naming every living creature. Now, naming living creatures, likewise, in this context does not mean producing some innovative creative name. It means rather identifying the essence. Once again, it isn't a creative act. It is a perceptive act. Dealing with the categories of reality, being able to resonate with what is real, and recognizing that anything that isn't categorical in that sense is simply not on the radar screen. Doesn't mean anything. For all intents and purposes, it doesn't exist. 
indeed. It is in that vein that we understand the final verse of Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. What does it mean? How does it connect with everything that we've seen? Well, simply this. For us, arithmetic is an excellent example of truth versus falsity. For them, everything was categorical truth versus falsity. Anything that wasn't true wasn't real. Anything that doesn't pertain to absolute categories of truth is simply meaningless. Walking around naked is something that we, in our post-tree world, unquestionably regard as bad. But it has nothing to do with categorical truth versus falsity. And as a result, for Adam and Eve, before eating of the tree of knowing good and evil, the idea of nakedness didn't compute. Again, all that is meaningful is truth versus falsity. Not subjective concepts, not individual perspectives, not even something like nakedness, which we could definitely identify as a subject of consensus for man in this world, for Adam and Eve. The very notion was a meaningless one. Animals aren't naked. They don't wear clothes because there's no reason for them to wear clothes. In this vein, Adam and Eve, likewise, were not naked. Now, when we consider this level of functioning, before eating of the tree of knowing good and evil, there is, of course, inevitably, at the outset, a glaring question that we can't help but ask, and that is, if you see things purely in terms of truth versus falsity, then there isn't any possibility of justifying what is false, because what is false is simply not real. As unreal as one plus one equals three. So if that's the level at which humanity is functioning, before eating of the tree of knowing good and evil, how could they possibly violate God's word? And this necessitates our considering one additional subtlety before we plunge into chapter 3 and consider the anatomy of the sin itself, and that is the extent that we are sentient beings, the extent that we have consciousness, it will never be quite as simple as we presented it at the outset. That is, of course, man did, and on some plane does, have the ability to see everything in terms of what is real and what is not. The problem is, as you may recall, Rene Descartes, in his Discourse on Method, burrowed down to the most inviolable certainty in all of life. I think, therefore I am. In Latin, cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am, means once I am a thinking being. The certainty that is most basic and most inviolable to my mind is my own existence. Now, the reason I'm stressing this point is if we ask, what really is the absolute foundation 
of all existence. If we believe in the words of the Bible, the answer inevitably is God. And at the same time, equally, inevitably, we recognize we as thinking, conscious, sentient beings can never really see it that way. We can doubt God. We can't doubt our own existence. That is a certainty that is completely inviolable. Well, that's, I submit, precisely what God says to Moses in Exodus chapter 33, verse 20. After Moses pleads with God to behold God's glory, to really be able to connect with God in absolute terms, God's response is, you cannot see my face, for man shall not, cannot see me while alive. If you're alive as a thinking, conscious being in this world, you may have that capacity to see everything in terms of truth versus falsity. But there's an additional dimension as well. You see things also in terms of yourself. Let's consider how that impacts on what takes place in paradise. In Genesis chapter thir- 3, beginning with verse 1, we read the seduction, the sales pitch, if you will, of the serpent. The question in verse 1, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of any tree of the garden, to which the woman, Eve, responds in verse 2 and verse 3, of the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. There are a couple of critically important observations that we should make in this verse. Of course, one point to note is that God didn't say, lest you die. God said, you would die, unequivocally, if you eat of the tree of knowing good and evil. But there's another, perhaps, more subtle, seemingly more innocent change in what Eve says with respect to the actual command that had been issued by God. That is, she says, you shall not touch the tree lest you die. Now, I feel compelled to share with you. We have in our tradition the portrayal of the seduction of Eve in which the serpent pushes her into the tree, so she touches it. And the serpent then said in verse 4, you shall not die. You see, you touched it, you didn't die. But of course, there's an additional dimension here, a deeper insight. And it pertains to what we already noted with respect to how the human mind worked before this event and where man begins to transform. We already noted that knowing truth and falsity means knowing categorical reality, perceiving reality, rather than creating. Perceiving includes here, of course, perceiving, receiving God's command. But you see here that something happened that wasn't merely receiving God's command. You shall not touch it wasn't part of God's command. Well, where did it come from? And of course, inevitably, the answer must be 
if it didn't come from God's command, if it wasn't part of the actual perception that was received from the divine command, it must have been created. Created by whom? Well, perhaps that when Adam informs Eve of the prohibition of eating of the tree of knowing good and evil, Adam adds to the prohibition, you shall not touch it. Perhaps, perhaps. We can conjecture here that the challenge that Adam faced on a very subtle level that inflates here is the challenge between asking what is the correct course in order to best resonate with the divine plan that underlies the creation of the world. That's one way of asking a question. But there's another way of asking what may seem to be the same question. And that is, what can I do that will best resonate with God's plan that underlies creation of the world? Let me repeat those two questions and let's appreciate where the difference between them lies. First version is, what is the best course for resonating with God's plan that underlies the creation of the world? The second version is, what can I do that will best resonate with God's plan that underlies the creation of the world? You notice there's a critical word that appeared in the second version that didn't appear in the first. That word was I. In the first version, the question is asked in purely objective terms. God has a plan for the world. What course will best resonate with it? In the second version, I'm asking from my perspective what I can do to resonate best with that plan. But you know, when I employ the second version, there is an unstated but inescapable presumption that I should be doing something. Maybe the best course for resonating with God's plan is for me to remain silent, inactive, purely perceptive, to not create anything. But when I ask the question in version number two, I don't countenance that possibility. And I strive to create something, to do something proactively in order to resonate with God's plan so subtle, such a slight divergence from the first version. But you know, everything results from that slight divergence. Because then, of course, inevitably, we can discern in the version of the divine command that Eve expresses, neither shall you touch it, that man is already becoming creative. And perhaps it is that very element of creativity that becomes further amplified precisely in the words of the serpent's seduction. You shall not die for, in verse five, God knows that in the day you eat thereof, your eyes will be opened and you will be as God Maybe we can render that as angels or great ones. Knowing good and evil, you will be endowed with the wherewithal to know good and evil. What's the difference between knowing truth versus falsity 
and knowing good versus evil. Very simply. When all you know is truth versus falsity, we reiterate, you're only perceiving reality. Whereas good versus evil ends up being a creative act as well. What do I mean by creative act here? Consider this. If in moral choice, doing what is wrong is simply false, it is as meaningless, as absurd, as non-existent as one plus one equals three. If the wrong moral choice is bad, is evil, it's real. Evil is real. It's not simply falsity. It's not something non-existent. It is an alternative course that I shouldn't do because it's bad. Well, how did that bad alternative come into existence if at the outset it didn't exist at all? And of course, inevitably, the answer is, I created it. The tree of knowing good and evil it doesn't generate evil. It generates the potentiality because it makes me into a creative being. By man becoming creative, this of course is not to imply that creativity is necessarily bad. You can create good things. You can also create bad ones. Good versus evil means you have become a creative being. And of course, the inevitable irony here is, on the one hand, that means being like the snake said, like God. God, after all, is the creator. And to the extent then that man becomes a creative being, it is by consequence of eating the tree of knowing good and evil that man becomes godlike. How ironic. Because simultaneously, of course, the flip side of the same coin is man becomes capable of committing evil. And indeed, when we consider the continuation of the narrative, the woman saw the tree was good for food, it was light, lust, craving to the eyes, and the tree was to be desired to make one wise. So she took the fruit thereof and did eat, and she gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat, and it worked. What the serpent said was true. The eyes of them both were opened. And the consequence of that opening is they knew that they were naked. Now remember, being naked didn't even exist to them before eating of the tree of knowing good and evil. Because when you function purely in terms of perceptions of reality, what is true versus what is not doesn't exist. It's not on the radar screen. Now it is. And now, of course, they feel a need to cover themselves. That transformation, indeed, is what God himself identifies in verse 22. Behold, the man is become as one of us. They really did become like God, to know good and evil. Man has become a creative being. And to that extent, on the one hand, man has become a godly being. But that's only on the one hand. On the other hand, 
endowed with the will of all to know good and evil, man has exposed himself to the greatest danger imaginable. The continuation in verse 22, and now, lest he put forth his hand and take all saw of the tree of life and eat and live forever, what's so bad about living forever? And inevitably our answer is, living forever? Nothing at all, as long as one lives forever in a redeemed state. When man is only a perceptive being, there is no danger in living forever. Once man becomes a creative being, knowing good and evil, there is the dire danger that if man were to live forever, he might live forever in a corrupted, perverse state of evil. And so, he needs death as that purification, the rehabilitation, to be redeemed by death and restored to that pristine state. Now, when we consider this dynamism of what takes place, there are a number of observations that are especially critical for us to make here. Number one, focusing on verse 7, and the eyes of them both were opened. In the Hebrew, were opened is, Vatipakachna. Now, because of our limited time, I'm not going to take you on an arduous journey right now in seeing all the many examples that illustrate this point, but um, for our purposes, it's important for us to consider that this verb for opening of the eyes is used in scripture where, ironically, it has nothing to do with a change simply in vision. Just consider when God opens the eyes of Hagar to see the well of water. The water was there all along. Her eyes were physically open. She was seeing all along. But there was something that was missing in her understanding, her perception of reality is what changed. We can consider the gamut of the additional examples here of Pakoch. We're not going to consider them right now, but what is most directly germane for our purposes is, and the eyes of them both were opened, and the text doesn't tell us, and they saw that they were naked. Rather, they knew that they were naked. They saw exactly what they had seen before. But the way they perceive what they see is critically, inexorably transformed. We can scarcely imagine how terrifying an experience this must have been that after eating of the tree of knowing good and evil, Adam and Eve know that they are gazing upon exactly what they saw a few moments earlier. And try as they might, they cannot tease out of their perception something that they know a few moments earlier didn't exist. The way they see the world, the way we see the world, is critically, permanently transformed. Man has become, again, a creative being, not merely perceptive, knowing not just truth and falsity, knowing good and evil. And it is in that vein, inevitably, that we consider not merely the sin, but its consequences. The consequences are critical, because the consequences, of course, 
pertain to you, to me, to all of us. Because we all live in the post-tree world. In verse 8, they heard the voice of God the Lord moving about in the garden toward the wind of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of God the Lord among the trees of the garden. And when God asks man as challenge, where are you? Man's response is, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Whereupon God seizes the opportunity to draw out of man the admission of what had taken place. Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree whereof I commanded you that you should not eat? And of course, the crime is disclosed and confessed. And what ensues are the punishments, of which there are inevitably three corresponding to the three accomplices in the crime. It's critical for us to note of these punishments. There is, of course, the punishment of the serpent, of the woman, and of the man. Only one of the three is cursed. And that is what we read in chapter 3, verse 14. That God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you from among all cattle and from among all beasts of the field. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. Of course, a point that we have had occasion to note in the past as well, but that is of critical importance here, is when we consider the content of the punishment, it doesn't seem like much of a curse at all to go upon your belly and eat dust. If the serpent were given legs a kilometer high and forced to eat dust, that's obviously a curse. How's it going to get to the dust? But to go about on its belly, well, on its belly, there's nothing more abundant than dust. Where then is the curse of the serpent in the Garden of Eden? And inevitably, our response is for every being, including the animals, there's a connection with God. A connection with God that derives from our awareness of our own limitedness. We have needs, and those needs necessarily draw us to God. As expressed in Psalm 104, verse 21, the young lions roar after their prey and seek their food from God. We don't have a clue what that means in practice, how the lion is connected to God by its roar for prey. But its needs bind even the animal to God. Every being, in as much as it has needs, has that bond. Every being that is except for one. There is one being that will never want for the fulfillment of its needs. The serpent will never run out of dust. So that in effect, what God says the serpent is, you will have everything you could possibly need in the world, except the one thing that really matters. As Asaf expresses it at the end of Psalm 73 and verse 28, as for me, the nearness of God is my good. God says to the serpent, take your sustenance and get out of here. You'll have everything except a connection with me. That is the ultimate curse. That's with respect to the serpent. What about with respect to humanity, the woman, and the man? It's not a curse. It is rather a realization. Man has chosen to become a creative rather than perceptive being. 
And God, in effect, says, you chose to become a creative being. Now you're going to have to live with the consequences of that creativity. Well, what is the most sublime creative act in which a human being can ever engage? Inevitably, the answer is creating another human being. God says, I will greatly multiply your pain and your travail in pain. You shall bring forth children. That act of supreme creativity is fraught with anguish. Being creative is no simple matter. So that's with respect to the woman. With respect to the man, creativity is expressed in eking a livelihood out of a recalcitrant earth. And that's precisely the point. Man isn't cursed. The ground is cursed. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns also and thistles shall I bring forth to you, and you will eat the herb of the field in the sweat of your face. You will eat bread till you return unto the ground. You want it to be creative? Well, this is the consequence of being creative. You have to deal with the anguish of creativity. Striving to create your sustenance. He get out of the ground in pain, sweat, and toil. But inevitably, once we recognize that these verses don't describe a curse, but rather the consequences of the act, we can readily appreciate what might otherwise seem to be a complete lack of congruity in what immediately follows. In verse 20, we read, and the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And in verse 21, much to, more, to our dismay, God has taken care of them. And God the Lord made for Adam and his wife garments of skin, leather garments, and clothed them. And I feel compelled to share with you that we see in this divine act archetypal kindness. So much so that in our tradition, the Torah begins with an act of kindness, and this is it. Clothing the naked is an archetypal act of kindness. Sin has its consequences. In that vein, we could certainly validly describe the consequences as punishment. But God isn't rejecting Adam and Eve. On the contrary, God's taking care of them. Now that nakedness has become, for Adam and Eve, a meaningful concept and something to be avoided, God takes care of clothing. And, you know, we already noted in verse 22 that the access to the tree of life at this point would be destructive to man because, after all, having attained the ability to create everlasting life could impose the danger of living forever in an unredeemed state. So we can understand why in verse 24, God drove out the man and placed him east of the Garden of Eden and blocked the passage to the garden to not be able to access the tree of life. But simultaneously, I feel compelled to direct our attention to verse 23, with the realization that here's another tantalizing incongruity that manifestly is here to teach us something. If all we were concerned with knowing was that man is denied access to the tree of life, just consider there's absolutely nothing that would be lacking in skipping directly from verse 22 to 24, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. So he drove out the man and placed him east of the Garden of Eden. Verse 23 is saying something entirely different. Therefore, God the Lord sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. What does that mean? He sent him forth. Sent him 
that drove him out, sent him on a mission. Because once we recognize what the inevitable consequences are of becoming a creative being, God says to man, you chose to become a creative being. You now have a mission in the world. It's not the same mission that you had in the Garden of Eden. You're not in the Garden of Eden. But it's not because you've been rejected. On the contrary, you are being sent. Because you have something to do in the world. And in that vein, I feel compelled to stress, just by way of conclusion, when we consider in verse 24 that God blocks the way to return to the Garden of Eden, to reach the tree of life. On the one hand, we recognize this is a fundamental transformation in man. This is the reality of the human condition. This is what will characterize all of human history in the post-tree world. But have we indeed really just lost everything? Unequivocally not. That is, while on the one hand, we do recognize that man abides not in honor, and as expressed likewise also in Psalm 49, man that is in honor understands not. So after the brief interval in paradise, Adam and Eve are banished. It's true, but there is that ongoing summons of man. In Psalm 90, verse 3, you turn man to contrition. You bring man to the crushing point, and you say, return, O children of man. So the tree of life itself remains elusive, but God hasn't taken from us life. On the contrary, as we read in Deuteronomy chapter 30, See, I have set before you this day life and good and death and evil. Verse 19, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that I've set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. Therefore, choose life. And you can still do it. Through the challenges, through the identity as creative man that you have taken for yourself. And indeed, even though access to the tree of life ostensibly is blocked, we still get to the tree of life. In Proverbs, repeatedly, the tree of life asserts itself. In Proverbs chapter 3, happy is the man who finds wisdom, the man who obtains understanding, which kind of sets the tone. It is through cultivating that wisdom and understanding that we get to verse 18, she's a tree of life for them that lay hold upon her. And happy is everyone that holds her fast. It's knowledge, that's Torah, it's God's word. In Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And indeed, in Proverbs chapter 13, desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Likewise, in chapter 15, a soothing tongue is a tree of life. We have all sorts of trees of life that we continue to access. It's up to us. We don't return, not here, not now, to Eden. But life, we can still access. And ultimately, indeed, God promises, we do return. Isaiah chapter 51, verse 3 Ultimately, God has comforted Zion. He has comforted her, all her waste places and has made her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of, the God, of God. Joy and gladness shall be found therein, thanksgiving and the voice of melody. In Ezekiel chapter 36, ultimately, when these words come to the fulfillment, we read in verse 35, and they shall say, this land that was desolate is become like the Garden of Eden, and the waste and desolate and ruined cities are fortified and inhabited. And by consequence, in verse 36, 
then the nations that are left round about you will know that I, God, have built the ruined places and planted that which is desolate. I, God, have spoken it. I will do it. So, we are into the Garden of Eden. And what I hope we've glimpsed in today's session is something of the anatomy of the sin that resulted in our no longer being there. And the human condition is indeed permanently changed. We are not in paradise anymore. We're in this world, a realm of creativity, where we are relentlessly summoned to create good, and likewise, repeatedly stumble in the process. But ultimately, that isn't a curse, it is a transformation. It is, as we saw, a new mission that pertains to us now that we know good and evil. And by having attained that knowledge of good and evil, we continue to be summoned. As expressed in Psalm 90, return, O sons of man. To take that creative capability and dedicate it to God and become worthy of his blessings. God bless you.